I thought this would be funnier than it is. It's not very funny at all, because I realized that my shirt pretty much looks the same as my last video. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll explain. I'm filming this video the same day that I filmed my last video, and whenever I do that, I like to change up my outfit a little bit, just like so you guys don't know that I film my videos on the same day. <laughs> but I thought it was funny because in the last video, I wore a gray shirt that was like a v-neck that I wore off the shoulder, and then in this video, I'm just wearing a green shirt that's a v-neck that I'm wearing off the shoulder. But they look almost identical, and it also just... It's not as funny as I was hoping, I guess. That's okay. Because I have another scary story for you guys. I also wanted to show you guys this before I get into the stories, because I have two. But I wanted to show you guys how cute this is. So, my friend Paige came to stay with me for a couple days, for like nine days. And I don't know if you guys know this, but I have a really weird collection of stuffed animals that are like fruits and vegetables. And so she brought me toast. It's a little toast. How fucking cute is this? And I mean, his face is kind of buried in his fur, but he's like a super happy little white. Oh my God, I love my toast. I love my toast. I wanted to show it off and I forgot to show it off in my last video. Also meant to throw that behind the couch and that didn't work. I guess we could put him right here. Actually, this is a scary video, so we can't have cute toast today. Sorry, sorry toast. But I wanted to share this with you guys and ignore my weird little bookmarks. I just, I needed to bookmark the pages. Also, is my voice really deep today or is it just me? I feel like I'm listening to myself and I'm like, who is this man? This is Tia's book. It has five scary stories in it and I believe it's available on Amazon. So I'll have that link down below. She gave this to me at VidCon and I'm not kidding. I've been so excited to read this and I have two stories in here that I haven't read yet on my channel. So I'm gonna read them right now. They're a little bit shorter. So I figured I'd put both of them in one video cause I don't want this to be a short video. But the rest of the stories in here, I have read on my channel. So if you guys wanna get the book and then have like an audio book in the background, it's perfect. I love Tia and I love her stories and I'm so thankful that I found her. I, I like, I have been blessed with this woman. So she gave me a copy of her book and you guys, okay. And this actually made me tear up a little bit and I'm like really bad with emotions in front of people. But on one of the first pages, it literally says dedicated to Courtney Semple, an amazing friend and role model. And I was like, oh my God. Like it literally, I like, I don't know. It just makes me so happy. Like I, I love this so much. And I haven't let myself read the two stories that I haven't read yet because I wanted to read them for a video and I'm finally getting around to that. So we're going to read them right now. This is going to be interesting because I've never read like from a book before. I usually just read from my phone, like on Reddit, but now we have a book. But both of the stories looked a little bit shorter than the other stories that I've read from her. So I just figured, like I said, I would put both of them in this video. So the first story is called The Eyes on Me. And then the second story is called, oh shit, I just lost my page. That's what I give her taking the bookmark out. The second story is called Can't Scream Loud Enough. So I'll have times down below for when each of the stories start. So if you guys don't necessarily like the first one, you can skip to the second one, vice versa. Actually, if you already got through the first one and you're listening to the second one, why would you skip back to the first one? Unless you liked it that much, which you probably will because it's Tia. Okay, so this first her story is called The Eyes on Me. For the past 13 years that my family and I have lived in our neighborhood, it's been relatively quiet. We live on a cul-de-sac in Appleton, Wisconsin. Nothing really happens here. That was until a few months ago. It all started when I was working the late shift again at the Sky Zone Trampoline Park. Usually the people we serve were parents taking their kids out for their birthday or something. It was pretty unusual to get an adult that just wanted to jump around. So when an adult man walked into the Sky Zone alone an hour before we were supposed to close, I immediately thought it was odd. He wore a long, thick wool coat that reached below his knees. He had on black slacks, black sunglasses, and was completely bald. I'm talking Mr. Clean type bald. And his nose was unusually small. He approached the front desk with a bit of a limp. And when I thought he was gonna stop walking, he kept on, bumping right into our front desk with a grunt. Are you okay, sir? I was a bit puzzled. Everything about him seemed off. I felt it in my gut. He nodded in my direction, but I couldn't tell if he was actually looking at me through his shades. After acknowledging me and regaining his composure, he just stood there, as if waiting for me to do something. What can I help you with today? The man just shrugged before dramatically leaning to his right. I honestly thought he was going to fall over. After a few seconds, I realized he was digging for something in the oversized pockets of his coat. He pulled out a white and red stick, about the size of a ruler, and held it out to me. It wasn't in an offering way, more so a demonstration. It then expanded to a full-size guide cane. I understood now, he was blind. Excuse me, but I think you may have come to the wrong place. This is a trampoline park. Are you here for a party or to meet someone? He stayed quiet but shook his head, tapping the cane in front of him before turning and using the cane to make his way out of the building, the same way he came in, but more sure of himself this time. I didn't think much of it for the rest of my shift, except, though I know he's blind, it still felt like he could see me through his glasses. A couple weeks passed and every now and then I'd feel as if I was being watched. I'd try and brush it off, 
The strange encounter with that man had almost been forgotten until I noticed a sale pending sign on the house across from us. Our old neighbors had been trying to sell to someone for almost three years and they finally had a buyer. The moving van pulled up on a Saturday. Couches, a bed, some tables. Men were unloading all day, but they all had uniforms on, so I knew none of them were the buyer. I had to go to work before I could notice anything else. That night, the blind man came in again. I had barely noticed him this time. He didn't come in, rather he stood outside, facing our front doors. He had the same glasses on and the same cane, and he didn't move, like, at all. My coworker, Isaac, noticed it too, and we both felt pretty off about the whole situation, so while I counted the drawer, he went outside to ask the man if he was all right or needed help. Isaac returned a couple moments later with a confused look on his face. Dude, do you know that guy? Not really, no. He came in once before. He's blind and new to the area, I think, so maybe he's trying to memorize his surroundings? No, Isaac drawled out before continuing. He specifically said he was here to see you, and then walked off to the other side of the parking lot. I looked up and noticed he was right. The blind man was gone, but why was he here to see me? What are you talking about? The guy doesn't even know me. Well, according to him, he knows you. He said your first and last name. Fucking weird, right? Isaac wasn't only a coworker, but a good friend, and I didn't want to seem like a wimp in front of him, so I just agreed. All I could think about was the fact that I never told the man my name, let alone my full name. Least to say, I was a bit shaken that night. Four days later, I had the day off from work, so naturally, I spent it lounging around my house and being as unproductive as I could. Napping, pigging out on junk food, and playing on my PS4. Basically, most of my day was spent in my bedroom, and one of the windows in my bedroom faces across the street, right at the house the new buyer just moved into. I ended up pausing the game I was on when I thought back on our new neighbor and how I hadn't seen him or her yet. I put my controller down and walked over to the window, peering through the blinds so I could get a better look at the house. All of their curtains were drawn, not allowing any light into the house. The only window that I could somewhat see into was the one on the far left on the second floor. It was larger in size, and the curtains only covered half of it. The other half exposed a room. A dark, empty room. But the sun lent in enough light to outline the figure of a person standing just to the side of the windowsill. Wanting to get a better view, I pulled up my blinds. It took me a couple seconds to realize what I was seeing. It was the man. I'd recognize his glasses anywhere. And he was facing the window, as if he was looking out and at me. I ducked down and stayed there for a minute before I realized how silly I was for acting in such a way. When I popped back up, he was gone, and the curtain was completely drawn. So the blind man was my neighbor. It did seem kind of sketchy, to be honest, but I brushed it off after finding out because, come on, the man's blind. He was old, blind, and harmless. Correction, old, blind, sketchy, and harmless. A week goes by and I neither see nor hear anything from or about the blind man. He was a mostly quiet neighbor, thankfully, and he really seemed to like keeping to himself. My mom has always been kind-hearted, and when I told her that our new neighbor was blind, it only took her two hours before she sent me over to drop off a plate of cookies for him. It was supposed to welcome him to the neighborhood or something. I rang the doorbell three times, and there was no answer. All of the curtains were still drawn, so I couldn't really tell if he was home or not. Like I said, the man was quiet. So I just left the plate of cookies on his doorstep to make my mom happy. That same full plate of homemade chocolate chip cookies sat there on the doorstep for days. Eventually, my mom had me return to take back the plate. The cookies were half torn into by animals and half moldy by then, so we just threw them away. I could tell my mom was a bit upset, but she just shrugged it off as the man being blind and old and probably didn't notice anything on his doorstep. And though I wanted to think the same way, I felt my sketchy meter going off again. The next day, I had to stay home and babysit my little sister, Renee, while my parents went to a family friend's birthday party. Renee is 11, and although she's young, she acts like an old woman, which is why I have no problem babysitting her, because she'll usually take a nap or six. As always, I decided to spend my free time in my room and was on FaceTime with Isaac. What's your schedule look like for this week? Uh, I close on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, but I was kind of hoping you'd be willing to cover Friday for me. I raised an eyebrow. Usually when Isaac missed work, it was over a girl. Don't give me that look, okay? It's Krista, that hot Italian chick that works at Starbucks. Ooh, Krista, huh? I don't know, man. I may actually ask her out on a date before you even get the chance, I joked. Shut up, dude. Come on, please. All right, all right, but you owe me. We hung up after that, but continued to Snapchat through the day. At one point, Isaac saw my snap and screenshotted it, but didn't reply for a couple minutes. I didn't think much of it until he called me freaking the fuck out. Oh my f- Dude, do you see what the fuck is behind you? His screaming in my ear made me drop my phone in surprise, and I had to scramble for a second to regain control. What? Was all I could manage. That guy, you know the blind guy? 
He was standing at your window with a creepy as shit smile. Just as Isaac said that, I swore I heard something snap from outside, so I whipped around, expecting to see the blind man, like Isaac said, but it was just darkness. I relaxed and rolled my eyes in Isaac's failed attempt to try and scare me. I didn't even reply to him. I just hung up and threw my phone on my bed before moving over to shut my blinds. Yeah, I understood it was just a prank, but the blind man topic did unsettle me, so I wanted to prevent my paranoia before it even started. As I began to relax in my bed again, Isaac began to blow up my phone with texts, saying how this wasn't a joke and I needed to lock all my doors. And just when I was about to ask him to prove it wasn't a joke, he sent the picture. It was the screenshot he took of my snap a few minutes earlier. I scanned the picture. Everything seemed to be fine. It was me, laying on my bed, with my back facing the wall, in my window. The air felt like it was being pulled from my lungs when I saw the blind man standing outside of my window with a bone-chilling smirk spread across his face. I, I didn't even reply to Isaac. I just bolted up from my bed and raced around my house, making sure to lock every door and window and close every curtain. I spent the rest of the night in my living room, facing the front door with a knife in my hand, just in case. You can call me an overprotective big brother all you want, but I honestly checked in to make sure she was okay every 15 minutes or so until my parents returned home. And if you think for one moment that I didn't tell them what the hell was going on, you're wrong. I sat down and told them every strange thing that had happened since that old man came into town. I even showed them the screenshot. My mom was speechless. My dad was enraged, and my mom and I had to talk him out of going across the street and starting something. Thankfully, my dad's best friend was on the force and lived the next street over, so I just asked him to have someone patrol the area a few times a week, just in case. I honestly thought that would make everything calm down. Then Friday night strolled around, when I was supposed to cover Isaac's shift. Tonight. Work was slow for the most part. A couple families came in, but nothing I couldn't handle by myself. We were originally supposed to close at 8, but since it was so slow, my boss said I could close around 7. So I started my closing chores early and locked the doors once the last family left. I only had to count the drawer and clock out when a dark blur moving outside of the main entrance caught my attention. I waited for a moment, believing I was just seeing things, when I saw it again and immediately froze in place. I closed my eyes and took a few deep breaths trying to calm my nerves and tell myself it was probably just someone walking to their car or something and continued to count the money. When I began to hear slow tapping against the glass, I nearly shipped bricks, and it took all of my willpower to look up and see who was trying to get my attention. To my discomfort, but with little surprise, it was the blind man, and he was tapping his cane against the glass door, seemingly trying to lead his way around. What I didn't expect was for him to pause when I looked at him, tuck his cane away, remove his glasses before winking at me and casually walking away. It's been hours since then. I can't sleep. I rushed home as fast as I could after closing and avoided any conversation with my parents when I got home. I went straight up to my room and locked my doors. I've been here since then. I can't will myself to move. That man isn't blind. He never was. Holy shit, okay, that's the end of the first story. Tia, you have to make a second part to that story. You cannot end it there. What happens? Does anything else happen? Does he keep following him? Is he still his neighbor? Spill the tea, Tia. And then this one's a super short story, so this one's called Can't Scream Loud Enough. My name's Clara, and I'm 29 years old. I live in Great Bend, Kansas, and I'm mute. I also used to work at a law firm that my sister's husband, Sebastian, owned. These are the only things you need to know about me before reading my story. Sebastian hired me about a year and a half ago to be a secretary at his new law firm. He and my older sister Chloe had been married for almost eight years when he decided to start the firm. I was hired on the first day since he personally knew me. I know you may be wondering how a mute woman could do a good job while working as a secretary, and it's simple. I answered most emails, scheduled appointments, and made sure our account stayed within correct balance. The phone calls would either be transferred to Sebastian or to the other secretary, Paula, and the firm ended up doing very well. Because of this, Sebastian decided to take my sister and I away for the weekend to a cabin on El Dorado Lake in celebration of the firm's success. I'd never been much for traveling, but was very excited for our small vacation, even if it was only a two-hour drive away. When we arrived, my sister and I marveled at the beauty of the land and the cozy cabin we would call home for the next few days. Chloe and I spent the first day swimming and soaking up sun rays while Sebastian went out on his canoe to fish. That night, we popped a bottle of champagne and laughed around the campfire. A good feeling lingered in the air until the morning. On the second day, Sebastian suddenly became distant and locked himself in a spare room, claiming he was sick. Chloe and I tried not to waste the day and went for a walk along one of the hiking trails. She seemed in distress, so I decided to ask her if something was going on. Well, more of a sign to her. What's going on? I asked. What do you mean? 
Sebastian and you, you two seem off today. Why did he lock himself in that room? He seemed fine last night. Chloe sighed and signaled for me to stop walking before moving us over to sit on a nearby bench. My sister and I had always been close, though there was a six year age gap between us. She learned sign language with me after my car accident and helped me out of my depression when I was struggling to come to terms with the fact that I would no longer be able to communicate like everyone else. It wasn't hard to figure out something was bothering her. I think Sebastian's cheating on me, she said, smiling sadly at me. I was taken back by her revelation, my eyebrows furrowed in confusion. Cheating on you? Why do you think this? I found some naked photos of women on his laptop and cell phone a couple months back. And this behavior of his has become my new normal. He'll be sweet and affectionate to me one day, and then completely distant and cold the next. I've caught him in lies before where he says he has to stay at work later than expected, but when I drive by the office, his car isn't there. I don't know what to think anymore. My sister hung her head low, feeling ashamed. I didn't hesitate to wrap her in my arms for comfort. We sat there like that for some time before she pulled away and wiped her eyes. I didn't even realize she was crying. And the worst part is, I think it's my fault. I haven't been putting out since I lost our baby. I just can't bring myself to do it. He gets so frustrated when I deny his advances in bed. I probably pushed him to do this. That's when I became angry. My sister was a beautiful person inside and out, and she didn't need to feel her purpose was to pleasure a man every time he asks, when she obviously just went through something very traumatizing as a woman. This is not your fault. You are beautiful and you are loved. If Sebastian is getting his non-existent balls in a twist because you aren't having sex with him every time he's horny, he obviously needs a fucking testosterone bottle to suck on. You don't deserve to be treated like an object when you just lost your baby not even a year ago. He should not be blaming you for any reason at all. Chloe sniffled and we hugged again. That night, we confronted Sebastian about his strange behavior together and my sister laid her proof that he had been cheating out on the table when he tried to deny everything. Faced with the facts, he became enraged. Who do you think you are to try and accuse me? I'm your husband. I will not stand here and be ridiculed by someone who is supposed to trust me until death do us part. He slammed his fist down on the table before storming out of the cabin and into the darkness, taking a full bottle of rum with him. My sister all but collapsed onto the floor in tears. Luckily, I was there to console her and tuck her into bed in one of the guest rooms when she fell asleep. I decided to make myself comfortable on the living room couch and keep an eye out for when Sebastian came back. A little while later, my eyes began to get heavier and I fell asleep. I woke to an uncomfortable weight on top of me. It was dark, so it took a few moments for my eyes to adjust so I could see. A drunken Sebastian was positioned over me, one hand clutching an empty bottle, the other struggling to undo the button on my pants. In an instant, I lifted my leg up so my knee connected his neck. He fell back with a gasp and stumbled against a side table, knocking off a lamp, causing it to shatter on the ground. The sound must have woken my sister because she came flying down the hallway within seconds and turned on the lights. I was standing by the couch in a panic while Sebastian lay on the ground next to the shattered lamp, groaning in pain. What happened? My sister asked, looking at me as she made her way over to her husband. He was trying to take my clothes off, I quickly signed, before motioning to my disheveled appearance and the empty liquor bottle still in his hand. Chloe was already halfway done with helping Sebastian up when my words registered and she dropped him like a rag doll. His shocked face when he looked up at her made me want to cheer with happiness and pride. You're drunk, she stated, looking down at him in disgust. It took him a few tries to get up, but he managed to do so with no help, still holding the bottle in a firm grasp. And you're a prude and a bitch, he slurred before trying to take another sip of straight air. My eyes widened in shock when my sister's hand connected with his cheek perfectly. Sebastian's head flew to the side and our eyes locked. His held surprise, mine held satisfaction. My sister then took him by the chin and turned his head to look at her. Her eyes were filled with rage. If you ever try and touch my little sister like that again, I will expose you to every media source within 50 miles of Great Bend. She let go of him and stepped back. Oh, and I want a divorce. I was in shock now. I had not expected her to say that at all. Chloe took one last look at him before turning away and walking to their room. I assumed it was to begin packing her things. Hold on a second. You can't talk to me like that, woman. Not to me. It didn't take long for Sebastian to follow my sister down the hall, enraged. I tried to follow both of them, but he slammed the door in my face and I had to balance myself so I wouldn't fall over. Sebastian, I don't want to hear it, my sister angrily stated and I heard her move closer to the door. I put my ear up to their door so I could listen better. You never listen to me. You never obey me. You don't even kiss me anymore. We haven't had a quickie in months and you have the nerve to try and blame me for our problems. You know what? Maybe you're right. There is a problem. You're my problem. Sebastian, 
Sebastian, what are you, what are you doing? Sebastian, no, stop. My sister screamed. I heard a bunch of scuffling on the carpet and something was knocked over into the dresser. My sister's struggled grunts came from inside and got louder and louder with desperation within a matter of seconds. My adrenaline kicked in full force when I realized Chloe was in danger and I opened the door. Sebastian sat over my sister's small frame. His hands were around her throat and her face was turning purple. He was killing her. I rushed over attempting to fend off my sister's attacker, but he used one hand to easily push me to the side, causing me to hit my head against the dresser. When I came to minutes later, Sebastian still sat over my sister, but his hands were no longer around her neck. My sister's head was turned towards me, her face pale, her eyes lifeless, her neck blue and yellow from bruising. He had killed her. He, he killed my sister. Chloe was gone. Sebastian's head shot towards my direction once he noticed I was awake. I could tell by his eyes that he was going to kill me too, but I was closer to the door than he was. I raced out of there, opening my mouth and pushing my vocal cords to scream for me in fear and in sadness, but of course nothing came out. Instead, the sound of Sebastian's footsteps behind mine echoed throughout the cabin. I proved to be faster since his bodily control was weaker from the alcohol. I made it out of the cabin and pushed my legs faster when I reached the tree line. I just kept running and I eventually stopped when I realized he was no longer pursuing me. I was confused at first, but realized he wasn't as impaired as I had hoped. Sebastian knew I didn't know the area, so I didn't know where help was. The cabins next to us were empty that week and I couldn't scream loud enough for anyone to hear me. I couldn't scream at all. With this realization, I dreadfully accepted I had nowhere to run. He could take his time hunting me. I was easy prey. I ran my hand through my hair in a panic before adjusting my pants that had never been fixed from the incident not even an hour before. When I did, I felt a weight shift in my pocket. My phone. I didn't miss a beat. I texted my mother and father right away, pinning my location and sharing it with them. Sebastian is drunk and went crazy and I'm in danger. Please send help and hurry. Afterwards, I silently climbed up a nearby tree and hid until police sirens sounded in the distance about 30 minutes later. I cried and cried, soaking an officer's coat who was assigned to watch over me until my parents arrived. They were devastated when Chloe's body was brought out and covered on a stretcher. We all just held each other and wept for my sister. Sebastian was taken away in handcuffs and charged with second degree murder. We buried Chloe a week later next to her stillborn baby girl. This was several months ago. Sebastian's court date is in three weeks and I'm the star witness in one of the biggest trials of the area in decades. I'm more than happy to testify against the monster who cold-heartedly took my best friend away from me. And all seemed well until my dad, who's also a detective, was given the news that Sebastian had broken out of prison yesterday. I'm writing this to you now from my parents' house. Once my dad got the call this afternoon, he had my mother pick me up from my apartment to stay with her until he got home from work. I'm the star witness. I am what is standing between Sebastian and a life of potential freedom. I have no doubt he's gonna come after me. I just don't know what lengths he'll go to. I'll update you until my dad arrives. 8.31 p.m. My dad just texted me. He's stuck in traffic and won't be home for another half hour or so. 8.35. I'm scared. It's not storming out, but the lights just flickered. I'm not sure. My mom just screamed from down the hall. If anybody can help us, please call the police. Our address is 184 care. Oh my, you have to be kidding. Like you actually have to be joking. That's literally where the story ends. Oh my God. Like I don't understand. I don't understand. I say it every single time and I will continue to say it for the rest of my life. I don't understand how you write these stories, Tia. I don't understand how anybody writes these stories. Like I know I'm never going to be disappointed with any of her stories. Like I literally like, oh my God. I, I love this shit. I love it so much. If you guys like these two stories, I really recommend checking out her book. She writes amazing stories like this all the time. She also has her poetry book, which I actually have to get into. I've read a couple of the poems and they're amazing, obviously, but I haven't had a chance to really sit down and read the whole thing. But oh my God, I will have this link down below if you guys like scary stories she's the perfect person for you she writes absolutely amazing stories and i've read a majority of them so i would know but i hope you guys enjoyed if you have any other stories you want me to read please send them to me i will have the email written down below or you can send them on social media on twitter or on instagram and i will find them i will find a way to find them find a way to find them all i have to do is check my messages okay whatever bye she also put at the end of the book that there's more coming soon so basically tia if you don't release a book in the next month i'm suing that's it